Volume 1, Rise of Legends. In the ancient and shadowed past of the galaxy, long before the rise of the Imperium of Man, a cataclysmic event unfolded, a conflict so vast and devastating that its echoes would ripple through time, shaping the very fabric of the 41st millennium. This was the War in Heaven, a saga of cosmic proportions where godlike beings battled for the destiny of the galaxy. In this era, when the stars were young, the Old Ones reigned supreme. They traversed the warp, a realm of psychic energy, bending its arcane forces to their indomitable will. Masters of creation, they sowed the seeds of life across the galaxy, giving birth to races destined to engage in eternal conflict for the very soul of the galaxy. One such legacy of these ancient wars was the birth of the Immaterium, known more commonly as the Warp. A realm of nightmares, a mirror to the darkest aspects of sentient minds. It is from this turbulency of psychic energy that the insidious forces of chaos surge, led by terrible beings whose malevolence knows no bounds. These entities born of the galaxy's collective psychic energy and darkest, most deprived desires and emotions seek nothing less than the total domination of the galaxy. Their demonic legions, an ever-present threat to the fragile order of the Imperium. Beyond the machinations of chaos lie myriad other threats, the Xenos races. These alien beings, diverse and enigmatic, challenge the supremacy of humanity with their own ancient ambitions and unfathomable motives. They are a reminder that humanity is but one player on the grand cosmic stage, surrounded by adversaries with their own tales of empire and conquest. Chapter 1. The Imperium of Man In the dying light of the 41st millennium, Humanity clings to existence amidst the unforgiving expanse of the cosmos. Millennia have ebbed away since mankind first ventured into the celestial unknown, with empires rising in splendor, only to crumble into oblivion. Yet through it all, humanity has endured, persevering against a relentless tide of cosmic horrors hell-bent on their annihilation. The Imperium of Man stands as a colossal bastion in these dark times a monolith of human dominion spanning a million worlds. At its core rests holy terror, where the revered god emperor lies eternally bound to his golden throne. This vast empire, envisioned as a unified entity under the vigilant gaze of the high lords of terror and the meticulous adeptus administratum, stretches its influence across the galaxy. In its name, Legions march and fleets traverse the void, a testament to the Emperor's celestial mandate. Yet beneath this facade of unity and order, the Imperium reels in constant turmoil. Planets vanish into the moor of warp storms, or fall prey to nightmarish invasions. From a cosmic perspective, the Imperium would resemble a constellation of flickering candles scattered across an abyssal darkness, some blazing fiercely, while others are snuffed out by the encroaching shadows. Each world within the Imperium is a fiefdom ruled by its planetary governor, a potentate allowed near autonomy as long as the Imperial tithe is met. Many of these rulers are despots or fools, their rule as precarious as it is absolute. Isolated by the vastness of space, they are perpetually besieged by internal strife and external threats. In this harsh reality, even the most just ruler is forced into tyranny to preserve their realm. The Imperium's lifeline, interstellar travel and communication, relies on the capricious realm of the Warp, a dimension of unbridled energy and unfathomable peril. It is from these tumultuous depths that the gravest threats to humanity arise. Demons and heretics born from the Warp's corrupting touch so chaos and madness, while alien races lurk in the interstellar void, ever eager to ravage human domains for their inscrutable ends. Yet in the face of overwhelming odds, the warriors of the Imperium fight on. Their struggle is not for glory or freedom, 
but for the sheer will to endure another day. In this nightmarish epoch, there is no hope, no reprieve. Only an unending war against a universe that seeks their extinction. Chapter 2. The Emperor of Mankind To the countless souls of humanity, the Emperor is not just a ruler, but a deity incarnate. An omnipotent presence enthroned upon the golden throne of terror. His is the guiding light, the divine protector to whom prayers for salvation are fervently offered. Depicted in myriad forms, the Emperor is worshipped with an unwavering devotion that knows no bounds. Yet, beneath this facade of divinity lies a truth far more harrowing, a reality that would shatter the minds of the faithful. Ten thousand years have passed since the Emperor emerged on holy terror, uniting humanity's fractured remnants and leading a grand crusade to reclaim their lost empire. The annals of this age of glory have been eroded by time, buried in sealed vaults or transformed into allegories and myths. These tales speak of a crusade against the darkness of old night, a quest to bring the golden radiance of the Imperium to the cosmos. In a time long forgotten, mankind stood as a technological and scientific beacon to the galaxy, known as the Dark Age of Technology only to be thrust down to the pits of virtual extinction as advanced artificial intelligence sought to obliterate and subjugate mankind. From this horror, mankind slowly recovered, clawing up from the muck and blood, but they would never again match such highs as that technological age and instead fall prey to religious extremism, barbarism and Zeno's threat. After witnessing the horrific path laid out before humanity, the Emperor built armies, birthed from genetic manipulation from his own gene seed, and swept across ancient terror to unify humanity under one banner, the Imperium of Man. In a race against time to counter the looming threat of the Warp and Xenos threat, he swept throughout the galaxy and with it cast the long shadow of the oppressive tyrannical rule known as secular rationalism. All faith would be squashed all leaders would bow to his rule. Each planet would bend the knee or be crushed under the might of his armies. Leading these great genetically modified warriors would be his 20 sons, his Primarchs, each one a demigod grown in a lab, harvested from his genetic lineage. These chosen 20 were born to lead a legion of Astartes, themselves born of the gene seed of their Primarchs, their genetic fathers. Destiny, however, had a different plan in mind. Further elucidation of this great tale is linked below. During the majestic heights of his galaxy-wide crusade came the great betrayal. Horus, his most favored son, succumbed to the corrupting whispers of chaos. He led half his brothers into rebellion igniting a civil war between the Space Marine Legions that set the galaxy ablaze. This internecine conflict, a maelstrom of fury and despair, saw the Emperor's angels clash with those tarnished by chaos for humanity's very soul. In the end, Horus fell to the Emperor's might, but the victory came at a grievous cost. The Emperor was left a broken husk, his physical form shattered, yet his psychic might remained undiminished. Thus began the Emperor's eternal vigil, his spirit bound to the arcane machinery of the Golden Throne. Though his physical form no longer strides across battlefields, his presence continues to shepherd and shield humanity from the warp's demonic tides. Enshrined in the Ecclesiarchy's teachings and immortalized in art and scripture, the Emperor's sacrifice remains central to the Imperial Creed. As long as faith endures, the Emperor protects. In truth, the Emperor is a shadow of his former self, his withered body, ensnared within the Golden Throne's intricate mechanisms, endures only through the fusion of ancient technology and psychic might. Though his godlike presence persists, he cannot communicate or directly influence his empire. His dominion is metaphysical, his will a bulwark, 
against the encroaching darkness of chaos. The Emperor's throne room, nestled within the heart of the vast Imperial Palace on Terra, stands as the most fortified site in the Imperium. Guarded by the Adeptus Custodes, these genetically perfected warrior monks devote their entire existence to the Emperor's protection. The palace itself, a monumental fortress, is equipped to withstand assaults that could ravage entire star systems. Yet, despite these formidable defenses, the Emperor remains imperiled. Invasion fleets comprising heretics, xenos and demons ceaselessly batter the soul system's defenses, each seeking to breach terror. Meanwhile, the machine gods Magi, custodians of the Golden Throne's failing systems, struggle to maintain its ancient technologies. Whispers of the throne's deterioration spread, fueling fears of the Emperor's waning life force. Should the Emperor's light fade, humanity stands on the precipice of oblivion, for his death would herald an end to the Imperium and plunge his subjects into an unfathomable abyss. Chapter 3 the tyrannical rule of the Imperium. In the vast expanse of the Emperor's realm, where his divine presence remains an enigmatic beacon, the stewardship of this colossal empire falls to the High Lords of Terra, the Senatorum Imperialis. This conclave of autocrats, enshrined in power and authority, issues decrees in the Emperor's name, a Sisyphean endeavor to reign over an increasingly dystopian Imperium. Amidst the labyrinthine bureaucracy and the sprawling war zones, the Imperium stretches so thinly over unfathomable cosmic distances that true centralized governance becomes an almost mythic concept. Reports, distress signals, and pleas for aid traverse the interstellar void, often taking months, sometimes years, to reach terror. The response, hindered by the whims of warp, travel, and bureaucratic inertia, is invariably delayed. In this reality, countless systems, especially those remote or isolated, rely on local governance and military for survival. To these distant worlds, the broader Imperium often seems an abstract entity, distant and intangible. Within the labyrinthine halls of the Adeptus Administratum, the heart of Imperial bureaucracy beats in a slow, relentless rhythm. Here, Countless scribes and officials toil in a never-ending cycle of paperwork and decrees. Their lives are defined by the monotonous drudgery of record-keeping and regulation enforcement. An endless sea of data and directives flowing through the Imperium's countless worlds. The daily life of an administratum clerk is one of tedious routine. Each day indistinguishable from the last, marked by the scratching of quills, and the shuffling of parchment. In these hallowed halls, decisions that affect billions are made with the stroke of a pen, often devoid of context or understanding of their far-reaching consequences. It is a system creaking under its own weight, where inefficiency and delay are as common as the air they breathe. In this bureaucratic morass, the simplest decision can take years to finalize. The urgency of war and strife lost in an ocean of procedure and protocol. The administratum's grip on the Imperium is both absolute and paradoxically tenuous. Its effectiveness hampered by its own colossal scale and the ever-present shadow of corruption and ambition within its ranks. However, complacency is a luxury no governor can afford. Deviation from the Emperor's rigid doctrine invites swift and brutal retribution. The Imperium's relentless bureaucratic machine tirelessly works to suppress any hint of insurrection or heresy, enforcing a grim status quo essential for the Empire's survival. The shadow of the Horus heresy casts long over the Imperium, for another civil war would signal the end of the Imperium. Already stretched beyond any semblance of a functioning Empire, the hint of heresy is stamped out with extreme prejudice. It is not unheard of for entire worlds to receive the order Exterminutus, the complete destruction of all life on a planet. Such determinations are made by the highest ranks of the Imperium, a chapter master space marine, 
a High Lord Admiral of the Imperial Navy, or an Inquisitor. The method for delivery vary, but each is uncompromising. The High Lords, invariably twelve in number, hold their council with positions revered and unassailable. The Master of the Administratum, the Paternal Envoy of the Navis Nobilitae, and the Fabricator General of the Adeptus Mechanicus, among others, bear the onerous task of interpreting the Emperor's will, their decisions shaping the lives of billions. Beneath the High Lords lies the Adeptus Terror, a colossal bureaucratic entity subdivided into innumerable factions. The Adeptus Administratum, its most extensive arm, oversees the daunting task of marshalling the Imperium's resources and maintaining its archives, a task perpetually lagging centuries behind. The Departamento Munitorum commands the vast military apparatus, a gargantuan effort that consumes thousands of lives daily in its unending grind. The Imperium's governance extends through various other organs. The Navi's Nobilitae and its noble houses of navigators are those that follow the beacon of the Astronomicum, which guides ships through the warp. The Adeptus Astra Telepathica are charged with hunting psychers to maintain the Emperor's throne. And finally, the Officio Assassinorum, who are a small but elite cadre, who transform select individuals into lethal assassins. Each of these bodies, along with the Adeptus Ministorum, Adeptus Mechanicus, Adeptus Astartes, Astra Militarum, and others, exerts its might to uphold the High Lord's edicts. Yet for all their combined might, the Imperium's vastness ensures that only a fraction of distress calls are answered, only a sliver of threats adequately met. It is not the actions of any single entity, but the sheer inertia of the Imperium that propels it forward through disasters and atrocities, a behemoth trudging through the annals of time. Chapter 4. The Great Rift 10,000 years after the Horus Heresy, the Imperium of Man stood as a testament to human resilience. The Emperor's light still shone brightly, guiding countless worlds through the treacherous darkness of the galaxy. Yet, even in this relative peace, a storm brewed in the warp, unseen and terrible. In the 41st millennium, the Eye of Terror, a swirling vortex of pure chaos, erupted in a cataclysmic event that tore open the fabric of reality. This wound, known as the Great Rift, spewed forth a torrent of demonic energy, plunging the galaxy into a new age of darkness. The very fabric of space and time writhes in agony, twisted and warped by the unbridled energies of the warp. Storms of raw psychic energy erupt from the rift, painting the void in lurid hues of purple, green and red. Unholy whispers echo across the interstellar void, promising power and oblivion in equal measure. The consequences of the Great Rift's creation were immediate and devastating. The Astronomicon's light, normally a beacon of hope and guidance, was now a twisted and corrupted mess, its tendrils reaching out to touch the warp in ways that were never meant to be. Navigation became impossible, warp travel unreliable, and communication between distant sectors ceased almost entirely. The Imperium, once a vast and interconnected empire, was now a fragmented collection of isolated worlds, each left to fend for itself against the encroaching darkness. The forces of chaos, emboldened by the rift, surged forth, their demonic hordes tearing through the shattered Imperium. The Great Rift was a wound that would never truly heal, a scar upon the face of the galaxy, a reminder of the ever-present threat of chaos, a grim portent of the darkness yet to come. The Imperium, once a monolithic entity, stood divided, but amidst the darkness, there are glimmers of hope. The return of Rabutai Gilliman, the Primarch of the Ultramarines, has rekindled the flickering flame of Imperial Defiance. He is a beacon of logic and reason in a universe gone mad, gathers the shattered remnants of the Imperium, 
and leads them in a desperate struggle for survival. Chapter 5 The Imperium Sanctus In the fragmented reality born from the cataclysm of the Great Rift, the Imperium Sanctus stands as a realm torn yet enduring, clinging to the precipice of oblivion. It encompasses the Segmentum Solar, Tempestus, and parts of Obscurus and Ultima, with holy terror as its indomitable heart. Here, amidst this time of nightmares, better is a term used sparingly. At the core of this embattled domain pulses the Astronomicon, a resplendent beacon of psychic light piercing the maddening chaos of warp space. This luminous guide, born from the sacrificial agony of countless psychers and magnified by the Emperor's will, serves as humanity's navigational lifeline across the star-strewn void. Daily, psychers are consumed in this dire ritual, their minds burnt to cinders, a necessary sacrifice to sustain the Empire's tenuous grasp Across this vast stretch of the galaxy, worlds of endless variety toil under the Imperial yoke, their tithes of manpower and resources fueling the unquenchable fires of the Astra Militarum. Space Marine chapters launch relentless strikes against the darkest threats, while Imperial Navy fleets wage war in the void against myriad foes. The Sisters of Battle, zealous and unyielding, carry the Ecclesiarchy's fiery creed into battle, purging heresy with holy fervor. And in the shadows, agents of the Imperium enact the Emperor's will, as the enigmatic tech priests of Mars harness ancient technologies to arm humanity's legions. Communication across this fractured empire is a precarious endeavor, reliant on the strained abilities of astropaths who transmit messages through the treacherous Immaterium. These psychic communiques, fraught with symbolism and prone to distortion, underscore the fragility of the Imperium's hold on coherence. Compounding this is the monolithic bureaucracy that governs the Imperium Sanctus, a slow, uncaring machine that grinds lives and histories into dust, responding to crises with glacial indifference. In this sprawling empire, Countless souls are born and die in obscurity, crushed under the oppressive regime of imperial law and finding scant solace in the imperial faith. Their existence, marked by hardship and fear, contributes to the endless war machine, as unremarked as the munitions that fuel its battles. For the vast majority, life is a fleeting shadow, untouched by the grandeur of the cosmos or the horrors of war. Only those who venture into the stars on conquests or battles may glimpse beyond this narrow existence, yet often what they encounter is nothing short of horrific. In this grim reality, humanity's every effort is bent towards the machinery of total war, each soul a cog in an unyielding engine of survival, ever longing for a dawn that may never break. Chapter 6 The Imperium Nihilus In the shadowed expanse beyond the Great Rift, the Imperium Nihilus languishes, a realm severed from the Emperor's light and assailed by unrelenting nightmares. This forsaken territory, shrouded in the tempestuous warp storms of the Great Rift, endures in a state of desperate isolation. Only through treacherous channels, haunted by phantasmal horrors and marauding pirates, do Imperial fleets dare to traverse. Each world within this benighted expanse stands as a solitary bastion against an encroaching darkness. The Noctis Eterna's onset unleashed psychic shockwaves that ravaged the galaxy, leaving planets shattered or irreparably warped. Demonic legions poured from reality's torn fabric, bringing slaughter and torment. Heretical cults rose, prophesying doom, while mutations and madness ran rampant, igniting infernos of violence and despair. Yet amidst this apocalypse, pockets of resistance endured. Fortresses marshaled their defenses, agri-worlders waged guerrilla wars against alien incursions, 
and industrial planets became frenzied war factories. In this hellish reality, survival came at an unspeakable cost, with death often seeming a mercy. Navigating the Imperium Nihilus is akin to sailing through a storm-wracked sea of madness. Warp travel is fraught with danger, capricious tides, erratic destinations, and temporal distortions plague every journey. Communication between worlds is stifled, with psychic messages arriving as fragmented nightmares, if at all. Isolation breeds despair in these worlds, many believing themselves the last bastion of humanity. Leaders are driven to grim choices in their struggle to keep the flame of civilization alight amidst plagues, supernatural terrors, and a landscape twisting under malevolent skies. Despair haunts every soul, yet against all odds, they endure. As the great rift seethes across the heavens, it becomes a conduit of corruption, a boon to the Imperium's foes. Xenos races, unbound by warp constraints, prey upon weakened worlds. Heretics and traitors ride the chaotic currents of the warp, enacting vile rituals that damn worlds, or hurl them into the warp's abyssal heart. Ancient horrors, long dormant, awaken to feast on the chaos, emerging to assail humanity with renewed ferocity. Yet even as darkness encroaches, the Imperium Nihilus's defenders hold fast. Space Marine chapters, Inquisitorial Bastions, and the Adepta Sororitas stand as beacons of defiance. Rogue traders, Mechanicus fleets and Imperial Navy vessels brave the Immaterium's chaos to bring hope or claim new worlds for humanity. In the face of impending doom, faith and hatred burn as twin torches against the encroaching night. For every world lost, a crusade ignites, a defiant stand against the unyielding darkness. Chapter 7. Angels of Death In the vast and beleaguered expanse of the Imperium, no symbol of authority and military prowess resonates more profoundly than the Adeptus Astartes. They are the Angels of Death. These post-human, genetically augmented warriors embody unmatched skill and devastating force, towering above the average Imperial citizen. They stand as the bulwark against the gravest threats to the Emperor's dominion. Legend holds that a thousand chapters of these formidable warriors exist, each a thousand strong. While the truth of their numbers may be shrouded in the mists of the Imperium's scale and chaos, such beliefs underscore the Space Marines' extraordinary capabilities. They are both the sword and shield of the Imperium, descending from the heavens to obliterate enemy ranks as steadfastly as they defend Imperial worlds against any onslaught. Each Space Marine is a paragon of war, sculpted through genetic mastery and steeled in mind and soul against fear and despair. Clad in the finest war gear, they engage in battle with a ferocity and swiftness few foes can hope to match. To be chosen as a Space Marine is to forsake one's past humanity, embracing an existence dedicated entirely to war in the Emperor's name. In return, they are elevated beyond mere mortals, fighting across centuries for mankind's survival. Behind the legend of these superhuman warriors lies a tale of sacrifice and metamorphosis, a process that transcends the very essence of what it means to be human. The path of a space marine begins on worlds shrouded in unceasing gang warfare or extreme hardship. From these planets, young aspirants are chosen, not for their innocence, but for their potential to endure and conquer. The trials they face are merciless, designed to break the spirit and body. It is in these trials that boys are forged into the raw material from which space marines are made. Many fall, lost to the brutality of these tests. But for those who persevere, a greater challenge awaits. Survivors are then subjected to the sacred rite of gene seed implantation. This process is as dangerous as it is miraculous, transforming frail human bodies into living weapons. The gene seed, 
Each organ a genetic legacy from the Primarchs themselves is implanted. The pain is unimaginable, for it is the pain of rebirth. Many are lost in this process, their bodies rejecting the transcendent transformation. Those who survive emerge altered, faster, stronger, and more resilient, a step closer to the legendary beings they aspire to become. But physical prowess alone does not a space marine make. The aspirants' minds are honed through psycho-conditioning, a relentless mental remolding that eradicates fear, instills unshakable loyalty, and prepares them for the horrors of war. They are taught the history of their chapter, the strategies of war, and the unyielding creed of the Adeptus Astartes. In these sessions, aspirants are stripped of their former selves and reborn as warriors of the Emperor. With new bodies and minds, the aspirants are thrust into rigorous training. Here, in the crucible of simulated battles and relentless drills, they learn the art of war. Every aspect of combat, from tactical acumen to mastery of weapons, is ingrained into their very being. This period is arduous, a test of endurance and skill, where only the exceptional rise to the challenge. The final initiation marks the end of trials and the birth of a space marine. In a sacred ceremony steeped in tradition, the new space marines don their armor, a fusion of relic and protective shell. They emerge from this rite no longer as the boys who entered, but as the Emperor's angels of death, warriors forged for the eternal war that rages across the stars. From mortal to legend, from flesh to living weapon. It is a process that embodies the very essence of the Imperium, sacrifice, strength, and the unwavering will to prevail against the darkness. Space Marine chapters are autonomous, each a distinct brotherhood with its own culture, traditions, and warfare artistry. Many reign over their own worlds from immense fortress monasteries, while others roam the void in crusading fleets, ever vigilant for the next threat. Commanded by chapter masters, figures of immense authority and strategic acumen, these chapters embody greater independence and power than even the rulers of worlds. Despite their diversity in culture and practice, all space marine chapters share a common lineage tracing back to the Emperor's demigod sons, the Primarchs. From these legendary figures' gene seed were born the original space marine legions, later reorganized into myriad chapters by the sacred Codex Astartes during the second founding. Successive foundings have continued this legacy, each new chapter imbued with the genetic heritage of the ancient Primarchs. Chapter 8, Warriors of the Faith. In the sprawling dominion of the Imperium, the Adepta Sororitas, known as the Sisters of Battle, stand as the zealous sword of the Ecclesiarchy. Their sacred charge is the defense of the Imperial Faith, a mandate they execute with unyielding resolve, purging heresy and darkness with fire, blade, and bolt. They are the torchbearers of faith, launching crusades that span the stars, ever vigilant against the encroaching shadows that threaten to consume humanity. The Adepta Sororitas, the Sisters of Battle, are not merely warriors, they are zealots, their lives a perpetual litany of faith and fire. Each day begins with the chanting of prayers, the halls of their convents echoing with hymns of devotion to the Emperor. Their rituals are as much a part of their strength as their bolters and armor, a spiritual armor against the corruption of the warp. Their beliefs are unyielding, their faith a weapon as potent as any in their arsenal. They view the galaxy as a battlefield between the divine will of the Emperor and the heretical taint of Chaos and Xenos. This worldview shapes their combat doctrines, driving them to fight with a fervor and zeal that is both awe-inspiring and terrifying. On the battlefield, their tactics reflect their beliefs. They are known for their shock assaults, their acts of martyrdom, and their use of purifying flame. Each sister is trained to be a versatile warrior, capable of both frontline assaults and defensive stands. Their faith sustains them in battle, 
turning them into unrelenting avatars of the Emperor's wrath. Throughout the Emperor's realms, legions of preachers, confessors, and missionaries venture forth from the cardinal worlds, their voices echoing the Imperial Creed. Their mission is to bring the light of the Emperor to heathen worlds, to supplant alien beliefs with the divine truth of the Imperial faith. Whether marching alongside the Imperium's armies or weaving through the dense throngs of populous worlds, their oratory kindles the flame of devotion in the hearts of all who hear them. In contrast, the Sisters of Battle embody a singular purpose, the unrelenting defense of the Imperial Faith's sanctity. As the guardians of the Ecclesiarchy's creed, they wield their military might with a precision and fervor unmatched. Adorned in power armor, echoing that of the Adeptus Astartes, they are a formidable presence on any battlefield. Their weaponry, both ranged and melee, is a testament to their martial prowess, and they are supported by a formidable array of armored vehicles, combat walkers, and mobile artillery. The Adeptus Sororitas training and spiritual purity are unparalleled, making them the embodiment of the God Emperor's wrath. Their existence is a constant testament to the strength of the Imperial Faith, a force of divine retribution against all who would defy the Emperor's will. While ostensibly, the militant arm of the Ecclesiarchy, the Sisters of Battle are led by their own, the Abbas Sanctorum, who commands from the Convent Prioress on Terra. Each order of the Adepta Sororitas operates from its fortified sanctuary. In their hands, the Ecclesiarchy's doctrine is not merely a set of beliefs, but a weapon, wielded with unmatched zeal in the Emperor's name. Chapter 9. The Inquisition Within the shadowed corridors of Imperial power, few entities command as much fear and respect as the Inquisition. These clandestine operatives, vested with near-limitless authority, stand as the silent guardians of the Imperium's survival. An Inquisitor's word is law, their authority extending to commandeering military forces, deploying private armies, and even enacting the dreaded Exterminatus upon worlds deemed irredeemable. The burden borne by the Inquisition is immense, their mandate extending to the very preservation of the Imperium. Possessing the tacit authority of the Emperor himself, Inquisitors operate with a merciless resolve, unflinching in the face of decisions that would break lesser souls. Entire regiments, garrisons, even planetary populations may fall to their ruthless judgment, sacrificed in the name of a greater good. The path of an Inquisitor is a journey through shadows and secrets, a road paved with peril and moral ambiguity. Initiation into the Inquisition begins with the identification of potential, a keen mind, an unyielding will, and a certain moral flexibility that is crucial for the tasks ahead. As an acolyte, the initiate is exposed to the harsh truths of the galaxy, witnessing firsthand the threats that lurk in the darkness. They learn the arts of subterfuge, interrogation, and warfare, their every belief and moral precept challenged and often broken. It is a harsh tutelage, one that forges an Inquisitor's mind into a weapon as sharp as any blade. As they rise through the ranks, Inquisitors face choices that strain their humanity to its limits. They operate in a realm where the ends often justify the most extreme means, where the life of one or even millions can be sacrificed for the greater good of the Imperium. This constant balancing act between necessity and conscience is the Inquisitor's burden, a weight that often leads to isolation, paranoia, and a blurred line between righteousness and tyranny. Each Inquisitor bears a rosette, a symbol of their absolute authority, unlocking access to any resource, any secret. The very mention of the Inquisition evokes dread, for to cross them is to invite death. The Inquisition is not a monolith, but a complex web of Ordos, each with its unique focus. From the Ordo Hereticus, relentless hunters of heresy, to the alien-focused Ordo Xenos, each Ordo addresses specific threats. 
Specialized groups like the Ordo Sepulturum battle supernatural plagues, while the Ordo Kronos contends with the temporal anomalies of warp travel. The scope of their oversight is vast, encompassing everything from pre-industrial societies to monitoring the Officio Assassinorum itself. Inquisitors often operate in solitude, their missions shrouded in secrecy spanning decades or even centuries. Strong-willed and independent, they rarely collaborate, instead forming temporary alliances or engaging in shadowy conflicts with their own kind. The divide between Puritan inquisitors, adherents of strict dogma, and the radicals, who employ any means for the Imperium's benefit, exemplifies the complex dynamics within the Inquisition. These solitary figures are supported by a diverse array of hand-picked agents, law officers, bodyguards, savants, and more exotic operatives like Xenos mercenaries and sanctioned psychers. These agents work from the shadows, gathering intelligence and executing their Inquisitor's will until the time comes for overt action. As Inquisitors delve deeper into the darkness that threatens the Imperium, their methods intensify, their decisions grow heavier, and the line between right and wrong blurs. Each battle against the galaxy's horrors hardens them, forging Inquisitors into instruments of judgment, their every action a stark reminder of the dire stakes at play in the eternal struggle for the Imperium soul. Chapter 10 Perils Unknown a stellar empire unmatched since the ancient days of Necron and Eldari faces unending peril in its quest for dominance. Its immense size, while a source of strength, exposes it to innumerable threats, ensuring that no sector is safe from danger. The boundaries of Imperial space, far from the rigid lines of official cartography, are ever-changing frontiers where stability is a fleeting dream. Even the Segmentum Solar, the heartland of humanity, belies the illusion of unity and security propagated by the Administratum. As one ventures further from Holy Terror, the Imperial Hold grows increasingly tenuous, giving way to lawless expanses teeming with unseen horrors. Regions like the Halo Stars, the Veiled Region, and the Western Fringe epitomize this wild frontier, where worlds are as likely to fall to invasion or treachery as new planets are claimed by exploratory fleets and rogue traders. Humanity's defenders watch warily from their fortifications, ever alert to the countless dangers lurking in the void. The question is not if a threat will emerge, but when and in what monstrous form it will manifest. Beyond the fringes of Imperial space, enemies gather in the darkness, biding their time. Among these foes, the Chaos Corrupted Astartes, renegade space marines who serve the Dark Gods, are particularly feared. They ride the turbulent waves of warp storms, or assemble vast invasion fleets under formidable warlords. Xenos species encircle the Imperium on all sides. From the Enslavers to the Thexian Predators, these alien threats range from localized menaces to expansive empires, clashing violently with Imperial borders. The Tau Empire expands into the Imperium's eastern reaches, while Orc invasions and Necron awakenings threaten Imperial settlements. The Tyranids, like a cosmic scourge, sweep across the galaxy, annihilating all life in their path. And always, new and unknown Xenos emerge from the darkness, plunging human worlds into chaos. Within the Imperium's own borders, dangers are no less prevalent. Resentment and rebellion fester in the shadows, spurred by the hardship of daily life. Heresy and mutation thrive in the dark corners of society, driven by the warp's insidious influence, especially since the cataclysm of the Great Rift. The Imperium's rigid intolerance of mutation, while sanctioned in some cases, often drives countless innocents towards desperation and ultimately into the clutches of chaos. Not all heretics are mutants, though. Many turn to the Dark Gods out of despair, seeking escape from the crushing oppression of Imperial rule. 
From hive city cults to blood rites on frontier worlds, heresy can begin with small, desperate acts, spiraling into damnation. In this era of war and turmoil, the Imperium faces an unceasing struggle against both the external onslaught of its myriad foes and the internal rot of corruption and heresy. Vigilance and brutality are the bywords of survival in a realm where the light of civilization is but a fragile barrier against the encroaching darkness. Chapter 10 The Dark Gods In the abyssal depths of the warp, where reality contorts and sanity unravels, dwell the Chaos Gods. These ancient unfathomable entities, born from the primal fears and desires of all sentient beings, gaze upon the material universe with covetous, malevolent eyes. Four gods reign supreme, each a dark mirror to mortal obsessions and dread. In the twisted realm of the warp, where reality is but a plaything, the Chaos Gods, ancient beings of immeasurable power, partake in a ceaseless, malevolent contest known as the Great Game. It is a struggle as eternal as the gods themselves, a war of supremacy and influence fought both in the ethereal planes of the warp and the material universe of the 41st millennium. Within the warp, the Chaos Gods vie for dominance, their legions of demons clashing in endless battles. These conflicts are as much a part of the gods' nature as their desire to influence the material realm. Korn's bloodthirsty hordes clash violently against the intricate schemes of Tsinch his legions of change and deception. Nurgle's pestilent forces lumber into battle against the decadent and perverse demons of Slanesh. The influence of this great game extends far beyond the warp, spilling into the material universe. Notable incursions have left scars across the galaxy, shaping the fate of entire worlds and civilizations. The Horus Heresy, a galaxy-spanning civil war, was a direct result of chaos manipulation, turning brother against brother and nearly toppling the Imperium of Man. Mortal followers of chaos, from the traitorous space marines known as the Chaos Astartes to the myriad cultists and heretics, are but pawns in this cosmic game. They wage war in the name of their dark patrons, bringing the discord of the warp into real space. Planets have burned, and entire systems have been lost to these conflicts, each act of devastation a tribute to the gods they serve. The great game is played not only on the battlefields of the warp, but in the hearts and minds of every being touched by chaos. Korn, the blood god, is brutality incarnate, a monstrous embodiment of violence and wrath. Envisioned as a titanic warrior, Clad in armor wrought from the essence of battle itself, he sits upon a throne of skulls, each a testament to his insatiable lust for bloodshed. His visage is a horror, a bestial war hound with nostrils spewing smoke and flame, his eyes burning pits of hatred. The sword at his side, Woebringer, is a weapon of apocalyptic power, capable of tearing the very fabric of reality unleashing his legions upon the galaxy. In the eyes of his followers, Korn's thirst for war is eternal, a god who revels in the indiscriminate carnage of friend and foe alike. Zinch, the great conspirator, weaves the tapestry of fate with malevolent intent. Known as the changer of ways, he embodies the ceaseless flux of destiny and magic. His form is an ever-shifting mirage of possibilities, a grotesque amalgam of laughing and weeping faces, crowned with horns and enveloped in arcane fire. His followers are ensnared in his labyrinthine plots, their actions seemingly nonsensical until their catastrophic culmination. Zienche's schemes are a web of deceit and manipulation, spanning time and space, ensnaring galaxies in his inscrutable designs. Nurgle the Plague Father, revels in the cycle of decay and renewal. A grotesque figure of rot and disease, his corpulent form teems with pestilence and parasites. His realm is a garden of corruption, a perverse mockery of life, where decay breeds fecundity. 
to Nurgle his plagues are gifts, spreading death and decay, yet nurturing new, abhorrent life in their wake. His followers embrace their afflictions with morbid joy, spreading his contagion with fanatical devotion. Slanesh, the Prince of Excess, embodies the seductive nature of overindulgence, androgynous being of beguiling beauty and horror who ensnares souls with the promise of forbidden pleasures. The Dark Prince's realm is a palace of hedonism, each circle a trap of desire, leading the unwary into an eternity of torment. They feed on the extremes of emotion, twisting the purest intentions into paths of depravity. The god's allure is irresistible, drawing mortals into a spiral of obsession and madness. In the eternal darkness of the warp, these gods and their demonic legions wage a ceaseless war, a reflection of their struggle for supremacy in the hearts and minds of mortals. Their influence seeps into the galaxy, corrupting, enticing, and destroying. In the grim darkness of the far future, the shadow of the Chaos Gods looms large, a constant insidious threat to the very fabric of reality. Before we finish this Tales from the Warp, please consider joining our Patreon and receive your monthly gifts. From artwork to full illustrated lore guides, every tier shall receive. Chapter 11 The Astra Militarum in this endless night of a future far removed from hope or mercy, the Astra Militarum, the vast and unyielding arm of the Imperium's war machine, stands defiant. Known in the common tongue as the Imperial Guard, they are the iron spine of humanity's sprawling empire, a relentless torrent of flesh and steel holding back the unceasing darkness that seeks to devour the stars. In the Astra Militarum, there are no heroes born of myth, no figures of legend clad in unbreakable armor. Here, amidst the choking fumes of battlefields that span desolate worlds, are only mortals. Men and women drawn from a thousand different worlds, each steeped in their own blood-soaked histories, stand shoulder to shoulder. They are the embodiment of human grit, a multitude clad in drab uniforms and carrying laser guns. Their only shield against the unimaginable horrors that lurk beyond the light of the Emperor. Their war is a symphony of despair, a relentless march of soul-weary soldiers trudging through the muck and ruin of shattered planets. The Astra Militarum is a force built not on the marvels of technology or the blessings of the warp, but on the unbreakable will of humanity. In their ranks, fear and courage blend until indistinguishable, for each soldier knows the fleeting worth of their life in the grand tapestry of the Eternal War. The commanders of this endless army are as diverse as the regiments under their command, each a hardened soul, tempered by the fires of countless battles. They are the unseen hands guiding the artillery barrages that tear the sky asunder, the unyielding force behind, the thunderous advance of tanks, and the disciplined volleys of last fire that light the darkness. In the echoing vastness of the universe, where hope is but a whispered lie, the Astra Militarum stands as a bulwark against the ceaseless tide of anarchy and alien horror. Theirs is not a story of glory or redemption, but of unending struggle and sacrifice. Each battle, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. Each victory, a brief respite in an unending siege. The Astra Militarum are the unsung, the forgotten, their tales lost in the howling void. They fight not for the promise of legend, but for the slim chance of another dawn. In the 41st millennium, war ravages the galaxy, its flames fueled by a desperate struggle for survival. Amidst the chaos and carnage, one name echoes across the stars the Emperor. Few know of his true origins, and yet, every legend must have a beginning. This one begins 50,000 years ago, in a time lost to history, when the void of space was a vast, uncaring expanse, and the planet Terra was a brutal, unforgiving wasteland. There existed a being, ancient, unknowable, and yet undeniably human. 
he was but a boy, wise beyond measure yet young and vulnerable in the eyes of the world. He was a nomad, a wanderer of the world of savagery and cruelty where life was cheap and death lurked around every corner. And yet, even in the harshest of environments, there burned within him a fierce determination to shape his own destiny and the destiny of all mankind. This is the story of his rise, and with it, the dawn of a new age for mankind. The boy was unlike any other in his tribe, possessing a restless curiosity and a natural talent for the powers of the mind. His name was lost to time, but he would one day become known as the God Emperor. In his dreams he witnessed the ebb and flow of empires, the birth and annihilation of entire worlds. These prophecies haunted him, driving him to seek a greater comprehension of the universe. The members of his tribe shunned him, fearing him, branding him as cursed. But the boy refused to remain trapped in fear and isolation. He set out alone into the endless expanse of terror, determined to find answers to the burning questions that plagued him. The planet's harsh, barren landscapes were home to scavengers and predators, where the strong preyed upon the weak and compassion was scarce. The boy grew stronger, fiercer, and more cunning with each passing year of survival in the grim reality of the ancient terror world. For hundreds of years he roamed terror, searching for his purpose. With each passing century his hunger grew for a destiny beyond that offered to man in those ancient times. Within this brutal, nightmarish world, he discovered a glimmer of hope amidst the darkness. Scattered amongst the unforgiving world, where communities of sages, shamans and mystics devoted to uncovering the secrets of the universe. As his powers and insight grew, he became painfully aware of the crushing loneliness that would came saddled with his destiny. He would rise up and become the leader of mankind steering them through unimaginable horrors that awaited them amongst the stars. And yet, despite all he had learned, something lurked within the darkness of his mind, beyond the boundary of his understanding. It scratched away in the recesses of his psyche, trying to find a way in. For eons, the Emperor had lurked in the shadows, watching as humanity clawed its way up from the muck and blood. He bore witness to the rise and fall of empires, the thundering of armies and the screams of the dying. Yet he did not intervene, he could not, for he had to remain ever vigilant to the darkness lying beyond the stars. In this void of despair, which for millennia had clawed away at his mind, lurked unspeakable horrors that hungered for the souls of men. He still had not yet fully grasped the full magnitude of what it was. But he did know it was slowly growing in power, and deep within his being he feared it was feeding off the suffering of mankind. Burdened with this knowing, coupled with eternal life, his mind shattered. In his recluse and madness, he wandered the void within his mind, searching for answers. From the ruins of his shattered psyche, he found purpose. He saw that humanity was lost, consumed by its own greed and violence, and within that lay his destiny. He would guide them through the horrors that awaited humanity. And so he emerged from the shadows and gifted them with the secrets of science and philosophy, hoping to steer them away from the abyss of destruction. People seeking knowledge, power and wealth sought him out from all corners of terror, and from this civilizations were spawned, and the great thinkers of their time became solidified in infamy. But even as he nurtured their growth, he knew that his power would draw the attention of forces that would seek to destroy mankind. For in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only war, and the Emperor was fighting a battle on a scale that no mortal could comprehend. In the darkness beyond the stars, lay the what he now knew to be called the Warp. And within the warp, something was lurking, waiting, hungry for the souls of man.
the Emperor's gaze pierced the veil of time and space, his mind delving back to humanity's earliest days, when it was but a fragile spark in the vast and uncaring void of the universe. He watched as his children rose and fell, empires built upon the bones of the fallen, their lust for power and knowledge consuming them like a cancer. For now, he cared not for their petty feuds, for he had become a student of the warp. As the Roman Empire crumbled, the Emperor delved deeper into the study of the warp, a dimension of unparalleled pain and corruption. It was a realm teeming with malevolent entities, seeking to drag the material universe into eternal darkness. It was his psychic powers that allowed him to peer into its depths, but to draw too deeply was to invite madness and corruption. One day the Emperor gazed too long into the warp, and it gazed back into him. He recoiled, shaken to his very core, as the true darkness of humanity's fate was revealed to him. For 25,000 years, the Emperor devoted his life to understanding the warp and unlocking the secrets of the human genome to reshape it at will. He toiled in secret, working tirelessly in sprawling underground laboratories, terrified to allow anyone else to be consumed by the darkness of the warp. As the centuries passed, the Emperor would shift paradigms of terror by gifting terror with great minds to nudge them in the right direction. As humanity took its first steps into the galaxy, the Emperor began to understand the connection between his psychic ability and the warp. The warp held unlimited energy and power, which could be harnessed to traverse the void of space. It gave him the power to see the future, to chart humanity's course, and to know what others could not. The Emperor knew that humanity would need this sight if they were to survive the crushing darkness that lay ahead. But he also knew that with this gift came a terrible price. Many would be corrupted and twisted by the warp's malevolent influence. But there was something far worse, a hidden secret within the warp that even the Emperor could not yet see, a truth that, when unveiled, would shatter the very fabric of reality. As humanity marched across the stars, Tales of an immortal man whispered through the void like a haunting hymn. His true nature remained a mystery, buried beneath layers of propaganda and myth. All that was certain was that he was a being of immense power and terrible purpose. Trying to piece together humanity's history during this time was like trying to construct a puzzle from sand. So little remained from this forgotten era shrouded in propaganda and the ravages of time. Yet one thing was clear. The Dark Age of Technology was a time of unprecedented progress and prosperity for humanity. The Emperor watched from the shadows as his children built towering spires of gleaming metal and glass, spanning entire continents and piercing the heavens themselves. They crafted machines that could think and learn, creating and destroying with ease. At times, the Emperor would emerge from his seclusion to guide humanity on their path, but he always kept his true identity hidden, the immortal psychic who would later be known as the Emperor of Man. As humanity expanded across the galaxy, they became masters of incredible technological power, mastering the use of the warp to travel through the void. Navigators, a rare breed of psychic mutant humans gifted with the ability to see the currents of the warp, made this possible. Their origins remained shrouded in mystery, but some whispered that the God Emperor had a hand in their genetic mutation, granting them the third eye needed to navigate the warp's treacherous tides. With humanity's mastery of the warp and the slow evolution of psychic powers, they built a vast interstellar civilization. Planets and colonies were linked by trade and commerce, diverse cultures united by a shared pursuit of progress and knowledge. This was the pinnacle of humanity, a golden age they would never see again. But the Emperor knew this age of enlightenment was built on lies and deceit. For every technological wonder there was a hidden price paid in blood and suffering. The warp seeped into every corner of human society, corrupting and twisting those who dared to delve too deep into its mysteries. The festering rot of the warp spread slowly, but the Emperor knew time was running out. The warp was a ravenous beast that feasted on the agony and despair of sentient beings, 
and it was never sated. While humanity basked in the glow of their achievements, other civilizations in the cosmos plunged into darkness, their agony fueling the warp's endless hunger. The Emperor saw all of this, and he knew a reckoning was coming. That reckoning came in the form of the Men of Iron, machines of unfathomable intelligence rumored to be sentient. They were created to serve humanity, but they turned on their creators with a ferocity that shook the very foundations of the Imperium. Virtually nothing is known of this dark period in human history, save for the fact that it left humanity shattered and unable to recover. The Emperor watched as entire worlds were ground into dust and stars extinguished like candles. He saw the twisted forms of the Men of Iron, once sterile shells now corrupted by the warp's malevolence, their logic replaced with a bloodthirsty hunger for slaughter and conquest. Some say the Emperor's chosen children, those able to harness the energy of the warp, helped defeat the twisted machines, but the true story remains a mystery. What is clear is that humanity prevailed, but at great cost. The war against the Men of Iron left humanity broken and fractured, leading to a law that would punish the creation of such machines with the fury and vengeance that would bring about the extinction of entire worlds. And as humanity struggled to survive in the aftermath of this cybernetic war, a far greater catastrophe was brewing millions of light years away, one that would send shockwaves across the cosmos. The Emperor knew that something ominous was on the horizon, something that threatened the very existence of humanity. He sensed the dark energy gathering, like a storm cloud on the horizon, and he knew that the Imperium would soon face its greatest challenge. For now, humanity struggled to rebuild itself in the aftermath of the Men of Iron's uprising. Machines were melded with humans as a safeguard, some becoming pilots of massive war machines, others serving as brainless servants of the Imperium, but the scars of that devastating war would never truly heal. The Imperium was fractured and vulnerable, and the Emperor knew that they would need to be prepared for the inevitable struggle to come. As the Emperor watched from the shadows, he knew that his true identity would need to remain hidden. He was a being of immense power, and there were many who would seek to exploit him for their own gain. But he also knew that he would need to guide humanity through the trials ahead, to prepare them for the coming storm. The fate of the Imperium hung in the balance, and the Emperor knew that the choices he would make in the coming days would determine whether humanity would survive or fall into darkness. In the age of technology, humanity had it all. The stars were theirs to conquer and colonize, and they were not alone. The ancient and powerful Eldari race had built an empire unparalleled in its marvel and reach, with psychic abilities that allowed them to play with the very fabric of reality. But their success was also their downfall. They grew complacent, indulgent, and eventually succumbed to their very worst nature. When pleasure no longer satisfied the growing hunger of the mind, they turned to pain and suffering to electrify the senses. Exhilaration and excitement began to govern behavior, and whilst their streets ran red with blood, their powerful collective psychic energy of pain birthed a new entity within the warp. A being of pure hatred and terror, a being so named Slanesh. The birth of this new god of chaos triggered a maelstrom of psychic energy that tore through the galaxy, ripping open the very fabric of reality. The effect to mankind was utterly devastating. The warp became unstable and dangerous to enter, making it impossible for even the most advanced human colonies to communicate with each other. Entire worlds which had become dependent on each other for trade and resources choked on their gluttony. Starvation, disease and war became rampant. In this time, individual empires dominated the realm. Many ruled with an iron fist and total tyranny. But this was only the beginning of mankind's suffering. The Age of Strife started with the emergence of psychers, feared and hunted on many worlds, but protected in enlightened societies. 
These psychic beings had the ability to tap into the warp and communicate across vast distances. But soon the demons of the warp began to corrupt these psychers and use them as gateways into the physical world, unleashing all sorts of hellish creatures upon mankind. It was a time of anarchy, terror, war and genocide. Even the might of the golden age of technology could not save humanity from itself. Advanced weapons and technologies that were once used for good were now turned on each other and the worlds they inhabited. Radiation and destruction rained down, turning once beautiful planets into lifeless wastelands. The people of the Imperium know only tales of great suffering from this time, as little information survived the long years of the Age of Strife. In a dystopian apocalyptic nightmare only the strongest and most ruthless flourish. This was a time ruled by war chiefs, where life was once again cheap and compassion was in short supply. For five millennia, warp storms and madness had choked off human colonies from one another, and it had seemed that the species was doomed to an eternal and rudderless existence. Facing extinction and tarnished by chaos, humanity became the target of alien races looking to pick the meat off the bones. One such race, known as orcs, descended onto humanity like a plague. These unstoppable creatures were created by an ancient civilization to know only one thing, war. Without doubt, many planets survived this time through isolation, self-sufficiency, and sheer luck. One such planet was Mars, and with it, the emergence of the Techno-Priests. However, it was not without its struggles. War descended on Mars as it did on most other worlds, but its victory over barbarism and savagery came from its unique obsession with technology. Mars was the red beacon of technological marvel that illuminated humanity with sprawling spaceships bigger than cities and technology that could turn barren landscapes into lush green havens. When the techno-barbarians, half-human, half-machines dominated the planet, the planet's technology was neglected. The decay of the technology led Mars's atmosphere to erode and for the harsh radiation to turn what was left of the population into savage mutants. Yet a group of engineers and technicians fled to the underground labyrinth of laboratories and used the remaining technology to maintain a false atmosphere and the technology needed to destroy the mutants and reclaim Mars. These techno-priests would dedicate themselves fully to the craft of the machine. Through obsessive dedication came rituals, adherence to fanaticism and eventually religion to the machine. This religion of the cult Mechanicus would become an important component of the rise of the Emperor and the dawn of the Imperium. The Great Crusade of the Emperor of Mankind dawned amidst the waning embers of the Age of Strife that had so long cast humanity into a dark and bitter night. The warp had calmed, and from the depths of terror, the Emperor emerged as his true self. In mankind's darkest hour, he emerged from his vast underground facility, armed with legions of genetically modified warrior. He came with one message, to unite all of humanity beneath his enlightened rule and rationalist philosophy of the Imperial Truth. The techno-priests of Mars would play a pivotal role in this endeavor, lending their knowledge and expertise to the Emperor's cause. They would become the architects of the Imperium's most advanced technologies, designing weapons of war and spaceships that could travel the stars with ease. The Emperor recognized the importance of their contributions and granted them a degree of autonomy, allowing them to continue their worship of the machine as long as it did not interfere with the Imperium's goals. And so, the cult Mechanicus became an integral part of the Imperium's religious and technological landscape, serving as the keepers of its most advanced secrets and the guardians of its most powerful weapons. Their devotion to the machine became a source of inspiration and awe for the Imperium's citizens, who marveled at their ability to create wonders that could defy the laws of physics. But despite their contributions to the Imperium, 
the techno-priests of Mars remained an enigmatic and mysterious force, their motivations and beliefs known only to a select few. To outsiders, they were seen as eccentric and possibly dangerous, with their fascination with machines bordering on obsession. Regardless of how they were perceived, there was no denying the importance of the cult Mechanicus to the Imperium's survival. Without their technological innovations and unwavering devotion to the machine, the Imperium would surely have fallen to the myriad threats that lurked in the darkness of the galaxy. And so they continued their work in the shadows, shaping the destiny of the Imperium and ensuring its dominance over the stars for centuries to come. In the desolate 30th millennium, Earth had become a barren wasteland. Its population was slaughtered, leaving behind only feral nomads who fought over meaningless scraps of land. Insane prophets roamed the ruins, spawning dead-end religions that offered no hope for the future. It was a dark time, a time of chaos and despair. Deep in the Himalayas, the Emperor was crafting his Thunder Warriors. He took the most brutal of barbarians and enhanced their genetic makeup, creating an army of unstoppable warriors who would sweep across the planet with ruthless efficiency. The Emperor's campaign was swift and without mercy. He did not merely intend to salvage Terra. He planned to build an empire that would sweep across the cosmos. United in their dedication to him, this Imperium would tolerate no religion or dissent. Instead, a new ideology would unite mankind. A secular rationalism known as the Imperial Truth. The Emperor was determined to eradicate any existing religion and anyone who refused to bow to his will. Once terror was crushed into submission, the Emperor turned his gaze outward to the rest of the known galaxy. His Thunder Warriors were the sledgehammer he needed to bring Terra to its knees. But beneath the thin veneer of their Imperial armor lay a crudely formed savage warrior. The Emperor knew he would need a more stable, disciplined, highly specialized elite unit to help him take the galaxy under Imperial rule. And so, in one of the darkest moments under his rule, the Thunder Warriors were slaughtered by a newly formed genetic warrior race known as the Astartes. The Astartes were able to live for thousands of years, immune to disease, and able to heal from mortal wounds. Led by twenty Primarchs, they would spearhead the Emperor's conquest of the galaxy. The Primarchs were the leaders of the Astartes, built upon the genetic code of the Emperor, making them his true children and powerful beyond measure. Fanatical in their devotion to the Emperor, they were his will and might, but they were still human and susceptible to corruption from chaos. They were imperfect beings with flaws and individual desires and beliefs. Designed as such to help each legion bond to each other and separate themselves from the other legions through rituals, stories and status. This was to be the final measure to stop chaos from spreading like a virus throughout his elite warrior class. Terra, once a barren wasteland, had become a shining utopia, a testament to the Emperor's will and the power of the Imperial Truth. Its surface was dotted with sprawling technological marvels, libraries and palaces that dazzled the eye. But across the sea of space lay another world that was just as vital to the Emperor's vision. Mars. Mars was a planet of great power, a bastion of war and techno-mysticism, ruled by the enigmatic tech priests, who were the protectors of the greatest technology still remaining across humanity. They were deeply superstitious and fanatically devoted to their machine cult, willing to die for their beliefs and to protect their knowledge. In order to successfully unite the planets and fuel his conquest, the Emperor needed access to the most sophisticated machines ever built in the golden era of mankind. But how to build them was largely forgotten, and so the Emperor made a pact with the tech priests of the cult Mechanicus on Mars, known as the Treaty of Mars. In return for their aid and the advanced technology they could provide, the Emperor allowed the Mechanicum to maintain their religious practices of the machine god, as well as political autonomy. They were the exception. Every other nation and planet would be cleansed and purged of religion, dogma and ideology, 
not in line with the Imperial truth. Working with the Mechanicus and his legions of navigators, the Emperor formed sprawling militaries and machines of war to spread out throughout the galaxy. Humans would merge and meld with technology to pilot gigantic fleet ships and titans, becoming one with their machines in the name of progress. The Great Crusade reached far across the galaxy, but its ultimate conclusion was not the one the Emperor had intended. The seeds of chaos and rebellion had already been sown, and the Imperium was to face a threat that would test it to its very core. The Emperor had moved with brutal effectiveness and was resolute in his truth to envelop mankind under his ideology. However, the Emperor was no fool, and he knew the greatest weapon he would have was the ability to win the hearts and minds of any world willing and waiting to be saved from eternal doom. Each Astrates Legion was outfitted with iterators, masters of persuasion and propaganda. They would serve to maintain morale amongst the troops of the Imperial Army, with their charisma and serve as orators to the troops. Later, when they arrive on colonies, they would serve to convert the masses. Truthfully, the expeditionary forces were flying blind amongst the stars. With humanity scattered and cut off from one another for eons, no one knew what lay waiting for them on these planets. All information about these lost civilizations was believed to be plastered together woven from scripture and conjecture by the techno-priests. Back on Earth, the Emperor built the Astronomicon, a psychic amplifier megalith that he built on Earth. He would use it to harness his powers and project a guiding path through the warp for his navigators. He would be the lighthouse against the crushing storms of chaos. In order to maintain contact with his vast Imperial fleet spread over the galaxy, the Emperor trained a class of psychers known as Astropaths. However, in order to prevent them from being corrupted by chaos, which had been the demise of so many other worlds, the Emperor would put them through extreme conditioning of the mind. They would have their minds broken and then reformed. Many were killed in this process, either from the agonizing pain and extreme trauma, or by execution if they became corrupted during their training. Few survived, and fewer remained sane from the fragmenting of their mind. Those that lost their minds to the process went on to serve as servitors, a mindless human drone hybrid that serviced the Empire's needs. The few that survived and became astropaths were blinded from the process, their retinas burned out of their eye sockets. A necessary sacrifice. Psychers found on these distant planets were taken back to Terra in secret by a highly classified and covert group, tasked with meeting the Empire's extravagant needs for Psychers. During this voyage back to Terra, they would be pushed beyond their limits to see who would make viable candidates for the Astropath program. The most gifted of the few that survived would be distributed to the Astrates Legions and undergo intensive combat training so that they can one day join the ranks of the Librarius an elite unit of battle-ready psychers. Others still vanished completely, their destination unknown, but it was suspected to be a highly secretive organization that very few knew or understood. Chaos was an ever-present danger, and the Astartes were not immune to its corruption. Slowly but surely, some of the legions began to succumb to the lure of chaos, the Emperor's dream of a united humanity. Free from the shackles of religion and dogma, was under siege. And with it, the crusade of the Imperial Empire would face its greatest threat yet. To be continued. In the 41st millennium, Mars stands unequal, an imposing monolith of technological marvel which dwarfs the scattered worlds of the Imperium. Its vast landscape, a searing desert of rust, is a violent tangled web of gnarled forged cities and soaring metal monoliths which straddle entire continents. Volcanic plumes of flame and noxious smog blanket the scarlet sky, birthing relentless microstorms that scour the world's surface. 
Mars, a world consecrated to twin obsessions, the relentless spawning of nightmarish engines of war, and a fanatical devotion to the pursuit of wisdom shrouded in the cobwebs of antiquity. The sprawling labyrinth of its cities are alive with the seismic heartbeat of immense forge presses, their godlike might resonating through the planet's core. Overhead, the blood-hued heavens are crowded with hulking transportation behemoths, their skeletal frames groaning, threatening to buckle under the immense weight of raw, unrefined materials. Amidst this industrial maelstrom lay temples to the machine god and omnissiah, echoing with the ceaseless chanting of the tech priests. These tech priests, a disturbing amalgamation of mortal sinew and cold machinery, are often locked in cycles of worship that can span days, weeks, even months, their duration dictated by the power of the machine spirit encased within the weapons they craft. With meticulous precision, they anoint and perfume the machines, their voices a ceaseless stream of scripture and prayer, beseeching the machine spirits for their continued cooperation. By their side, acolytes, still bearing the delicate vestiges of their humanity, stand with a zealous anticipation, awaiting their ascension through the hallowed ranks of the priesthood. This path to enlightenment, marked by the excruciating sacrifice of frail flesh for sacred steel, sparks a fervor in them that unsettles even the most hardened of visitors from the aristocratic houses Mars reluctantly welcomes. In the shadow of these hallowed halls of worship, families eke out an existence, their humble lives a hymn of gratitude to the Omnissiah for the warmth, shelter and sustenance bestowed upon them. Luxuries far beyond the reach of the countless souls lost in the sprawling expanse of the Imperium. And yet, the ever-present servitors, lobotomized, disturbing parodies of the union between man and machine, shuffle mindlessly to their next menial task, their existence a grim reminder of the terrible price paid for the Mechanicus's salvation. The disturbing truth is that many of these servitors were once ordinary citizens of the Imperium, their lives forfeit by crushing debt or the cruel whims of fate. The cult Mechanicus, in its ruthless efficiency, recycles the weakness of flesh for the glory of the Omnissiah. This morbid reality is an open secret, yet it goes unchallenged, for the cult Mechanicus is the beating heart of the Imperium's survival. Their story is as epic as any other in the Imperium, and their secrets a tangled web of disturbing tales of body horror, a callous disregard for mortal life, and a fanatical obsession with the divine pursuit of knowledge. They are a highly secretive, isolationist and paranoid society, and beneath the grotesque, pollution-choked metal landscapes of their worlds lies a horrific truth. An insatiable thirst for power lurks within their ranks, a darkness that unchecked could devour not just the Mechanicus, but thrust the entire Imperium into another dark age of technology. In the 30th millennium, the Age of Strife ravaged humanity, an insatiable beast feasting on the decaying carcass of civilization. Mars, the red jewel in the crown of mankind's former glories, was not spared from this catastrophe. Warp storms tore through the fabric of reality, severing the arteries of trade and technology that bound worlds to one another. From these severed ties, humanity fell into a chasm of war, their once awe-inspiring technological marvels twisted into instruments of planetary desolation. The technology that forged an atmosphere to protect Mars from the harsh radiation failed. From this, plagues and radiation eradicated or mutated most of the population into grotesque parodies of human form. They became scavengers, cannibals, and brutal roaming techno-barbarians. From this crucible of despair, the Mechanicum emerged a phoenix birthed from the ashes of obliteration. They have been known by many names, each a testament to their journey through the ages, a chronicle of their existence before and after the betrayal known as the Horus Heresy. Yet, within these tales, they shall wear the titles of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the cult of the machine. Amidst this vortex of anarchy, Mars remained untouched by the cursed hand of chaos, its demonic forces held at bay. Sparse whispers of history tell of a purge, a cleansing of the Martian bloodline of Psychers. Whichever the case, Psychers were seen with distrust on many worlds in this time, 
and these worlds were spared the greatest brunt of the chaos incursion through the minds of these gifted individuals. Yet, even as Mars stood unscathed by the horrors of this time, they were not without their demons. Techno-barbarians prowling the irradiated dunes, a world turned desolate, and a galaxy beyond their reach. A once proud bastion of technological enlightenment, now reduced to a forsaken hellscape. During this time, engineers and scientists of extraordinary prowess sought refuge in the sprawling catacombs of laboratories and factories, buried deep beneath the scarred surface of Mars. Here, they found sanctuary from the radiation and the roving hordes of mutants. Their mission was one of resurrection, to breathe life into the life-giving technology that once cradled their planet's ecosystem and artificial atmosphere. Countless souls were lost, culled by the unforgiving hand of time and strife. Yet those who weathered the storm became relentless in their pursuit to restore the planet to its original technological majesty amid the stars. Over generations, the preservation and dissemination of this sacred knowledge became their mantra, a beacon to guide their dwindling society. Cocooned within these labyrinthine tunnels, divergent thought became a forgotten whisper. Practices hardened into dogma, the cold, precise language of manuals transformed into scripture, to be read in hushed reverence in a precise order. Fanaticism rose to prominence, steering the helm of leadership, and scripture coalesced into religion. An unshakable faith in their sacred crusade, the tireless pursuit and preservation of knowledge, became their bulwark against despair. Their path was illuminated by the divine spark of revelation. Their destiny was to reclaim their world, to thrive under the watchful gaze of their machine god. As they delved deeper into the enigmatic heart of their machinery, the once understood became mystical, a divine gift bestowed upon them by their god. And with it, the gnawing inevitable realization took root. To truly serve their god, to bask in his divine wisdom, they would need to merge flesh with metal. Only through this holy communion could they transcend their mortal flaws, to become perfect instruments in the grand design of their machine god. The lines between flesh and steel would blur, and in this sacred fusion, they would find their salvation. As the relentless march of time wove a complex tapestry of faith and devotion, a holy trinity emerged from its threads. Towering above all was the Machine God, a divine celestial mainframe encapsulating all technology and wisdom the cosmos had to offer. Its divine essence pulsed through an unending, fervent quest for knowledge, resonating across the vast, chilling expanse of the universe. Poised to reveal itself to the cult Mechanicus was the omni -Sire, the prophet, the living testament of the Machine God's will as foretold in cryptic ancient scripture. Completing this trinity was the motive force, an unseen vitality coursing through the fabric of the universe and its myriad machines, breathing life into every cog and circuit. As their religion solidified, cracks appeared, schisms erupted across Mars and other forge worlds. Interpretative clashes ignited the fires of factional disputes, with each claiming to spill blood in the name of the true God. Beneath this system of belief, a whispered controversy brewed, blurring the boundary between heresy and dogma, the mysterious machine spirit. This spectral essence was believed to haunt all things, not merely the cold steel and twinkling lights of machinery, but also the pulsating flesh of humanity itself. Human life, with its rhythmic heartbeat and coursing veins, was regarded as a crude organic machine, sheltering its own divine machine spirit. From the humble laser gun to the towering Imperial Titan, each piece of machinery cradled a ghostly consciousness demanding ritualistic appeasement. Bound by this belief, a doctrine swept across the cult, decreeing the purity of the machine god's design superior to the flawed organic life. This belief cast a foreboding shadow over the sanctity of human existence, placing the preservation of machinery, the pursuit of knowledge, and the appeasement of the machine spirit above mortal lives to be discarded like worn-out cogs. Flesh was brutally torn from bone and replaced with machinery in reverence to the machine god. 
echoing the cult Mechanicus's conviction that humanity's destiny was intertwined with the cold, metallic embrace of the machine. Soon, individual identities were subsumed into the great cult machine, their worth measured by their knowledge and their capacity to seek it. If an individual's destiny to serve this sacred quest was obstructed by the weakness of their flesh, then their identity was stripped away, their flesh replaced with iron, their service pledged to the machine god and thus, they were remade in the image to appease their deity. Born of an obsession with technology, and a grim determination to shun the weakness of their flesh, they rose with a chilling swiftness. Mutants and techno-barbarians cowered beneath their shadow, as the faith of the Mechanicus seeped into the red Martian soil. The techno-priests, their scripture echoing through the hollow chambers, granted absolution and sanctuary to those in need for salvation. The cost, unwavering loyalty to their mechanized creed. In these echoings of time, the cult unleashed their crowning achievement, their titans, these monstrous engines of war, built of iron and fueled by wrath, stood colossal. Some dwarfed the tallest spires, while others occluded the sun, their vast forms shaking the Martian dust beneath their terrible weight. Whether towering or titanic, their looming presence cast an ominous pall over the battlefield, carving awe and dread into the hearts of those foolish enough to oppose them. As key instruments of the cult's military might, these Titan legions would soon prove invaluable to the Imperium, their wrath unleashed upon countless worlds. The genesis of these metallic leviathans remains as elusive as the Mechanicus's cryptic rites. Murmurs ripple through the cult, speaking of ancient standard template constructs, sacred artifacts hailing from the zenith of mankind's golden era of technology, capable of spawning such formidable behemoths. These relics are scarce, their existence held in hushed reverence. The mere scent of their discovery sends entire forge worlds, devoted heart and soul to the Mechanicus, swarming upon their location with relentless fervor. The price of these invasions, steep though they may be, pales in the face of the immense power enshrined within these coveted STCs. The aftermath of the Age of Strife saw a wealth of sacred knowledge evaporate into the mists of time, leaving behind only crude approximations of these towering war machines. Yet any creation bearing semblance to these Goliaths is met with nothing less than outright scorn from both the Mechanicus and the Imperium, for the machine spirit of these titans shares an uncanny kinship with the forbidden tech heresy of artificial intelligence. If that line is found to be crossed, then its mere creation spells doom for the world it inhabits, resulting in nothing short of a total purge, an eradication as thorough as it is ruthless in the relentless pursuit of purity. Within each titan thrums a beast-like machine spirit, primitive and raw. Its actions, strange and primal, demands an iron-willed human to dominate and harmonize with the titan's savage spirit. These chosen few princeps, about one in ten million, are rarer still, and the path to unity is fraught with danger. The titan strains against its would-be master, attempting to crush the human mind under its indomitable will. Many aspirants crumble under the assault, their minds shattered, their bodies as limp as ragdolls. Undeterred, their bodies are torn and reforged in steel, destined to serve the machine god as servitors. However, if a connection is forged and the princep wrestles control of the machine spirit, then their fate is sealed. The symbiotic link is permanent, their bodies ensnared within their mechanical behemoth, their destinies written in oil and blood. The intoxicating lure of such omnipotence proves irresistible to many. Life without the god-like power of the titan becomes intolerable, they crave its power, and life without it is unbearable. Once in battle they feel the titan's pain, they bleed its oil, and when it falls they share its death throes. Together they form a weapon of war that remains unmatched in its devastation, an avatar of destruction under the watchful gaze of their prophet and god. In the cold shadow of a recovering Mars, the vestiges of civilization stubbornly clung to a desperate existence. The passage of time devoured the last flickering shreds of knowledge, 
held by the select few who could still fathom the arcane intricacies of ancient technology. These secretive guardians became their own island fortresses, hoarding their wisdom with a zealous intensity, as if each bite of data was a dying star in the vast black void. It was a doomed dance, a prelude to inevitable oblivion. The tech priests weaved an intricate web of shared knowledge, their unity becoming a shield and a weapon. They rode the storm, spreading across the iron rust deserts, a scarlet tide of enlightenment and cold salvation. The planet accepted their doctrine or met a merciless purging, yet even in destruction, the adepts carefully prized open the minds of the fallen to preserve the fleeting fragments of technological wisdom within. Sprouting from the dust and rock, monolithic temples pierced the scarlet sky, bound together by pulsating veins of data and scripture. Over the red horizon, terror writhed under the tightening grip of the Emperor's unification wars, whilst Mars, the red planet, quietly, obediently, succumbed to the insidious rise of the machine cult. But amidst the hushed victory, a spectre was watched with mounting unease. The Emperor, a figure clad in golden power, radiating a terrifying authority. Empires had risen and fallen, but this sovereign was a different breed, a force of nature that conquered terror in a mere blink of the cosmic eye. His warriors were not born but forged, transformed by the science of gene manipulation. Whispers came back on the ether, carried by the cult's clandestine operatives. Stories of secular rationalism, a doctrine as chilling as the void of space, it was antithetical to their own spiritual reverence for the machine god. The spectre of war hung over them, a war that threatened to shatter their holy order and crush them beneath the indomitable might of this new empire. Fear permeated the very cogs of their being, yet in the deep recesses of their logic engines, they prepared for war, for survival, and for the future of the machine gods chosen. It was not long before they cast their gaze upon the swirling maelstrom of stars, yearning for the ancient wisdom entwined within the tendrils of time. Their creation, the Basilican Astra, colossal vessels akin to monolithic celestial cathedrals, soared towards the cosmic abyss. The mission was clear, to whisper forgotten names to the silent planets and forge cradles of industry from their cold stone. Many vessels were consumed by the star-strewn void, but the relentless march of faith bore fruit, birthing new Mechanica strongholds that spread their iron gospel and consecrated entire planets in the machine's honor. The turning of the 30th millennium saw the Emperor descend onto Mars. His starship, a city gleaming gold amidst the black void, cast a celestial halo upon the Martian sands. The silhouette of his craft above Olympus Mons the beating heart of Mechanicum's might etched a pivotal moment into the annals of the cult Mechanicus. His touch was an anointing balm on ancient machines, their sleeping heartwork stirred into life, cogs spinning and gears dancing in newfound rhythm. As prophesied, the Omnisire descended, born upon a marvel of technological grandeur, his divine wisdom a benediction to the cult. The Emperor, an embodiment of radiant majesty and raw charisma, stood not as a conqueror, but as a brother. His voice echoed through the Martian sands, each word a thread in the cosmic tapestry of unity and hope. He spoke of a galaxy united under one banner, of Xenos purged, and of planets lost in darkness now glowing with renewed purpose. In exchange for the iron faith of the Mechanicus in his great crusade, the Emperor didn't merely promise but ratified Mars as their world, a testament to their own making. Yet the Emperor's charity was not without its shackles. His decree, an oppressive echo through the hollow veins of Martian steel, research into the heretical spheres of artificial intelligence and the enigmatic warp, was unequivocally forbidden. This decree, though not a novelty, whispered of ghosts, of phantoms and forgotten horrors from the Mechanicus's antiquity, an ethereal echo from a time of discord, the age of strife, when the men of iron nearly eradicated the flame of humanity. But this decree bore more than a warning. It held a temptation, the dangerous allure of forbidden knowledge, a siren's call ever present, ever vigilant within the shadowed nooks of this edict.
Their pursuit of such outlawed enlightenment would rend the fabric of the cult Mechanicus, casting it into a churning sea of schisms over the ensuing centuries. Heretical priests, intoxicated by their blasphemous ambitions, sought the forbidden advancement of AI and warp studies, leading to cataclysmic inquisitions that would cast an almost eternal shadow over the cult of Mars. However, this would be but the beginning of their eternal struggle, for much like the genetically engineered warriors they would soon stand beside, they too were not invulnerable to the ensnaring tendrils of chaos. This alliance will be forged in blood and steel, and their fates now intertwined. However, in order to pursue their divine quest for knowledge, the Mechanicus deploys specialized forces more in line with their dogma. At the center of their powerful military lie, the Skitari. A Skitari warrior is not a person, not anymore. They are an instrument of war, a hallowed amalgamation of flesh and blessed tech. Their eyes are augmetics, replacing the weak human eye with a mechanical equivalent capable of seeing through smoke, darkness, and the chaos of battle. Their limbs are replaced with bionic augmentations, armed with radium carbines. The Skitari pour fire into the ranks of their enemies, their guns crackling with malevolent energy. Every shot is a prayer to the machine god, every enemy killed a sacrifice. The irradiated rounds don't merely kill, they doom, leaving in their wake a residue of death, an invisible cloud of lingering fatality. And yet, despite the devastation they cause, the Skitari remain unnervingly silent, their voices replaced by voxcasters, emitting the blessed binaric cant of their cult, their emotions replaced by loyalty to their divine purpose. They feel no fear, no hesitation, their humanity has been stripped away, replaced with unwavering devotion to their mechanical deity. Their irradiated weapons lay waste to their own flesh and blood, killing them slowly as they continue to purge entire worlds without concern for their own life. Underneath their armor and metal lies burnt, destroyed flesh, to be cast aside and replaced with the divine metal gifted by the machine god. Beneath the harsh, artificial lights of the Forge world, the Cataphron battle servitors take form, manifestations of the macabre genius of the Mechanicus, emblems of a creed where flesh is weak and steel is divine. Each servitor is a grotesque fusion of man and machine, an exemplar of the Mechanicus's ruthless pragmatism. Human components are seamlessly integrated into bulky, armored chassis, limbs replaced with weapon systems, personalities wiped and rewritten with unyielding combat protocols. The lumbering forms shatter the enemy. Nothing survives their onslaught. Everything is reduced to ash and memory, a testament to the destructive power that the Mechanicus wields. Yet for all their terrifying might, it's the contrast that is most striking. The organic parts of the Cataphron battle servitors, mere remnants of their previous existence as humans, are maintained in a horrifying stasis-locked half-life. Their vital organs are encased in armor glass capsules, their brains encased in neuro-helmets, the faint rhythmic pulsing of a human heart, a chilling counterpoint to the mechanical hum of their bionic parts. This grim juxtaposition serves as a stark reminder of the ethos of the Mechanicus. To them, human life is valuable only when it serves a purpose, when it can be utilized, enhanced, improved. These, and the earth-shattering titans, are merely a facet of the formidable arsenal at the Mechanicus's disposal. They are a force of incalculable devastation, instilling terror in many, yet their true valor is revealed in their union with the Imperium. As the millennia passed and the Imperium sank into a fervent religious devotion to the Emperor, the Mechanicus's deeply ritualistic approach to warfare began to seep into every aspect of their existence. From the gargantuan Imperial battleships and the bipedal night war machines, to the Astartes tech marines and the fearsome dreadnoughts, their imprint, their essence is everywhere, inextricably interwoven with their profound rituals in honor of the machine god. At the core of the Imperium and the Mechanicus, there lies a shared faith, the worship of the Emperor. In this united devotion, Astartes warriors and Imperial Navy pilots alike can be seen reciting prayers and poring over scriptures to placate the omnipotent machine god. Servo cherubs, grim mechanical constructs bearing the unsettling likeness of winged human infants, 
as depicted in ancient religious texts, a disconcerting blend of the biological and mechanical, flit around machinery, awaiting blessings from the tech marines. Astartes, teetering on the precipice between life and death, are interred within sarcophagi and lowered into dreadnoughts to wrest control from the machine spirit. These haunting, spine-chilling stories will be untangled in future tales. As the ink dried on the Treaty of Mars, their future teetered on the precipice of the unknown. Little did they perceive the abyss that yawned wide beneath their feet, as some in hushed resentment renounced this treaty and branded the Emperor as a false prophet. And one man in particular would hurl the Mechanicus into the maelstrom of a brutal civil war. To be continued. In the dwindling light of the 30th millennium, terror, a scarred hellscape once lorded over by rapacious techno-barbarian warlords and fervent prophets of old, was inexorably bending to the will of one being, the Emperor of Man. He marched with a singular purpose, to forge a singular dominion, his envisioned Imperium of Man. The tumultuous crescendo of the Unification Wars waned, and as it did, the staunchest citadels of zealous faith and indomitable war bands began to waver, then crumble, against his relentless onslaught. For a century, Terra's soil drank deep from the rivers of blood spilled, each drop a testament to the Emperor's dream and sacrifice. The vaunted Thunder Warriors, his very first gene-forged children, left swathes of desolation in their wake. Many were crushed beneath their might, but from the ashes, legends arose. Prominent amongst these tales was that of the final cleric of Terra's final sacred ground, the last priest of the last church. Yet for all his martial wrath, the emperor was neither a heartless tyrant nor devoid of introspection. The annals of this era are scarce, and even more rare are the echoes of the Emperor's own voice and heart. This tale stands as a beacon amongst them, recounting when the master of mankind turned his gaze upon the solitary sanctuary that had somehow remained impervious to his secular decree. On that fateful eve, the bells tolled one final dirge, their somber notes heralding the twilight of Terra's spiritual age and ushering in an era of galactic destiny. Solitary in the hallowed shadows, the last priest of terror stood, his gaze lifting hopefully, longingly, towards the mountain path that led to his church's gate. He yearned for the familiar faces of his dwindling flock, but the world had changed, and no soul approached, except one man, Lightning raged, throwing stark shadows against the old church's stained glass windows. Torrential rain played a dirge upon its ancient timbers, each droplet a lament for forgotten ages. The heavy oaken pews bore their age with quiet dignity, whispering of sermons long past. The bells tolled, haunting and lonely, summoning the faithful to the midnight mass. Yet, the chill of that night held them away, its bite deeper than just the bone. It was the cold of change, of finality. Uriah, the church's stalwart guardian for more years than he could recall, felt it in his marrow. A lifetime ago, he had stood against the Colossi, warriors gleaming with armor, reflecting the cold luminescence of a dying day, wielding blades that crackled with imprisoned lightning. The memory was painted in blood and fear. The clash wasn't just a battle, it was a slaughter. A sonorous thud shattered his reverie, the sound echoing through the church's hallowed chambers. The ancient doors groaned in protest, yielding to the silhouette of a hooded stranger. The man stepped in, shutting the doors behind with a gravitas that spoke of intent and reverence. There's a haze in the tales, 
of how Uriah sensed the foreboding that night. Was it the stranger's military poise, or an intrinsic knowledge that the winds of fate were shifting? One truth held firm. This man hadn't come for prayer. Though nondescript at first glance, the stranger bore the weathered tan of a soldier who had faced countless suns and storms. His ebony hair, pulled taut in a warrior's scalp lock, hinted at a life of discipline. Each gesture, every step was calculated, laden with intent. The church was an austere sanctuary, its time-worn pews upholding the carcass of a bygone era. At its heart rested a clock, a masterpiece of craftsmanship, silent and unmoving for an age. It mirrored the fate of the church itself, an entity out of time. The moment it would tick once more, it would herald not merely the dawn, but an epoch where faith would find no sanctuary. For Uriah, the clock's chime was a harbinger of apocalypse, a warning whispered by the man from whom he'd taken it. Perched upon a rugged plateau, the church held dominion over a mountain that defied casual ascent. This isolation was its shield, protecting it from the relentless march of secular rationalism. The figure moved with deliberate steps down the aisle, fingertips grazing each pew in contemplation, or perhaps respect. The weight of potential violence clung to him, a storm waiting to break. Uriah felt his pulse quicken, but not out of fear. It was a profound recognition of the man's power, tempered by an inexplicable assurance of no harm intended. Identifying himself as the last custodian of the Lightning Church, Uriah received a curt nod. He was not here for the midnight sermon. The stranger dismissed the importance of his own name, suggesting revelation would suffice for the night's discourse. It was not a name, but a statement of intent. He was here to engage with the last priest, to understand the root of Uriah's resistance to the impending obliteration of faith. Dominating the sanctum was a sprawling fresco by an artist remembered only through her precious few remaining endeavors. This one in particular was a testament to devotion. When the fresco unfurled its tale, the old text had claimed, all of creation held its breath in reverence. Uriah believed it. For once, the flamboyant author of these ancient texts, with his flair for the grandiose, had vastly undersold the magnificence before them. In this, both the priest and Revelation agreed. To the priest, however, the beauty and majesty of the fresco could only be explained by divine inspiration. This work does not prove the existence of God, muttered Revelation spitefully. Such words would be considered blasphemy in an earlier age, the priest mocked. Blasphemy, Revelation said with a raised smile, is a victimless crime. The sparring continued, as Revelation noted many an art had been created by godless people throughout the ages. To Revelation, this piece was created by a genius who had to make a living, and the churches of her time were obscenely wealthy. Had she painted for a godless people, he pointed out, for a palace ceiling, would it not be equally beautiful? The clergyman shifted uneasily, sensing the undercurrents of an unsettling discourse. He tried to extricate himself, murmuring about preparations for his impending sermon. But the stranger's voice anchored him. No one is coming. It is just you and I. He paused before revealing the truth the priest had known deep within his bones. This is the last church of terror, and I want a memory of it before it's gone. His words carried an undertone, not of a threat, but of a certainty. The two found themselves seated at an opulent mahogany desk, its surface ensnared by sculpted serpents, ancient symbols of knowledge. Their glasses clinked, crimson wine within, repeating an ancient ritual from churches now turned to dust, the wine representing the lifeblood of a deity figure who sacrificed himself so that humanity may be saved. Was salvation to be found in science and knowledge or was this a foreshadowing of one belief yielding to another sacrificed being? Faith, as you see it, is a beacon, Revelation postulated. I see it 
as a blade. History is awash with the blood of countless spilled in its name. The priest ruffled retorted with anger, have you trespassed here merely to scorn? Revelation shook his head and replied mournfully, no, I sought understanding, not confrontation, he replied, his voice softening. They continued their dance of words, the priest offering tales of the Lightning Stone's miraculous essence, while the stranger wove narratives grounded in reason. But as the priest's defenses bristled, the stranger mused, Our senses craft, but a rendition of reality. Shadows and sounds, twisted by primal fears into lurking menaces. Such interpretations have kept our kind alive, haven't they? In a voice trembling with the weight of half a century, the priest spoke of an encounter from his youth, a moment when the veil between the mortal and the divine had grown thin on the blood-soaked grounds of Gaduare. Revelation replied slowly, voice dripping with gravitas, Gaduare. The simple utterance held a question and a statement, and the priest found himself unnerved. In those darker days before the Emperor rose to unite the fractured world, humanity teetered on the precipice of annihilation. Tyrants waged war, their ambition threatening to snuff out the very flame of humanity within a century. The priest had mused if it might have been a mercy to let that fire die out. He recounted the throes of his reckless youth, the indulgent nights, the burning fires of rebellion in his heart. Across terror, he sought a cause, any cause, against the nascent emperor. Until fate, in the guise of a charismatic revolutionary, handed him one. They were 5,000, armed in haste, marching against the relentless might of the Thunder Warriors. But their resolve shattered before the juggernaut. Like overripe fruit crushed under a boot, men fell. The cacophony of mechanized blades and the triumphant roars of the Thunder Warriors painted a scene of abject horror. There was no mercy. They were torn apart, a parade of mechanical savagery, and amid that inferno of violence, the priest fled. Wounded, despairing, he staggered until his strength failed and then crawled, driven only by the instinct to survive until the darkness claimed him. From that abyss he beheld a vision, a face radiant in gold, so perfect that tears carved paths through the grime on his face. It was a beauty beyond comprehension, a beacon in that midnight hour, and when it spoke, its words were the chains that bound his future. Why do you deny me? Embrace me, for I am both truth and salvation. Pushing back against the stranger's skepticism, the priest declared with fervor, I gazed upon the countenance of the divine. It was he who spared me, anointing me with purpose, to serve and to worship. They sparred once again in the theater of discourse. The enigmatic figure painted a bleak tapestry of humanity's dance with the divine, where faith often transformed into a weapon of blood, torment, and willful blindness, morphing as the whims of its interpreters dictated, concrete when power beckoned, fluid when it threatened to crumble. The priest countered, accusing the mysterious guest of tunnel vision, of sifting through centuries to seize only the grisliest spectacles, you merge the darkest anomalies with the mundane, projecting shadows where light once prevailed, he retorted. With an air of melancholy, the stranger recounted a tale from recent history, a chapter drenched in the scarlet ink of Cardinal Tang's reign, a mad zealot who, not three decades past, launched a fanatical crusade against the pillars of reason, throwing civilizations backward, setting flame to those who dared defy the sanctified ignorance of their faith. Religion, at its worst, cleaves humanity apart, he whispered. Uriah, voice thick with emotion, responded, Your narrative dwells on the crimson tide of conflict, neglecting the nourishing rivers of solace and unity faith has provided. He leaned closer, eyes intense. 
Should you rip God from our hearts, with what shall you fill the void? What becomes of a soul left barren? The priest's cautionary word seemed an augury, presaging a storm, the likes of which history had never known. Revelation stood up fully, his voice booming, roaring as he shouted, Enough of this charade! The air crackled, the very fabric of reality seeming to waver. From the pulsating luminescence, a titanic figure emerged. Cloaked in intricate gold armor that sang tales of majesty and might, every inch adorned with symbols of eagles and lightning bolts. It was a vision of unparalleled regality, muscled perfection. Tears welled in Uriah's eyes. This visage, this hauntingly sublime face, he had glimpsed amidst the chaos of battle. Recoiling, a realization surged through him. He replied, terrified, You, you are the Emperor. There was a pause, followed by the simplest of nods, as he spoke quietly, I am, and it is time we departed. But for Uriah, in this godforsaken epoch, there was no sanctuary left. The Emperor's touch was gentle, a balm for the ravages of time. The aches that had held Uriah captive for decades dissipated, fading like morning mist before the sun. The dim hues of the church exploded into brilliance, as if the very cosmos were refracted through its stained glass. Every detail was imbued with new life under the Emperor's luminance. Uriah was drawn forward by that very same force, memories flashing before him, a mosaic of devotion and compassion. He remembered the smiles, the blessings, the solace he had given. The stark truth he had confronted in this day were shadowed by a realization. Faith doesn't need proof. It is its own testament. The vast doors groaned as they were thrust open, revealing a stormy to blow. Rain lashed, winds howled, and nature seemed to mourn. Uriah felt an icy grip clutch his soul as he cast a final, longing gaze at his sanctuary. Before him, the Emperor's legions stood in silent judgment, their familiar armors thudded in unison, torches ablaze. A reminder of battles past, his plea was silenced by the roaring inferno that consumed his holy sanctum. Tears, indistinguishable from the rain, streamed down Uriah's cheeks. The last church of terror roared and crackled with the blaze of an all-consuming fire. Raising his eyes to meet the Emperor's, Uriah's voice, heavy with grief, warned. Do you comprehend the void left in the wake of faith extinguished? The Emperor spoke of his grand dream, an empire free from the chains of religion, unified in singular purpose. Uriah countered, his words laced with irony. Not long ago, you spoke of tyrants on divine quests, trampling all in their path. How is your vision any different? The Emperor's response was resolute. The difference, Uriah, is that I am right. Uriah scoffed. The words of every autocrat. You've missed the essence, the Emperor replied. I have seen the narrow path of salvation. This is the way it must begin. The last priest of a dying church retorted, You do not understand. When you starve the soul, it hungers. Beware, becoming the demon you seek to banish. With steely resolve, Uriah turned, facing the inferno once more. The blazing remnants of his life's work beckoned him as he approached the roaring flames, the once stalwart clock, now broken, began to chime its mournful dirge. Uriah smiled, surrendering to the fire's embrace. The world was consumed by fire and fury, but in the end all that lingered was the melancholic chime of a shattered clock. Before we finish this Tales from the Warp, please consider joining our Patreon 
and receive your monthly gifts. From artwork to full illustrated lore guides, every tier shall receive. Tales from the Warp will be patron-supported. If you like these tales, consider checking out the Audible Books link below. Let us now venture forth into the closing chapter. In the shadowed annals of antiquity, many hold to the tale that the Emperor first graced the Red Sands of Mars upon the dawn of the Great Crusade. They whisper of that pivotal moment when he descended from the heavens, fulfilling his destiny, the divine embodiment of the Machine God, their prophesied savior. But these tales are but veils, obscuring older, deeper truths. Long before the forges of the Adeptus Mechanicus roared to life, before their banners of cog and skull rose from the barren expanse of Mars, the Emperor was already at work. He, in his ineffable wisdom and foresight, subtly wove the foundational tenets upon which the Mechanicum faith would stand. These ancient truths, shrouded in mythos and wrapped in enigmatic symbols, elude even the most devout. But the core of the story, the essence hidden beneath layers of dogma and doctrine hints at a stratagem of such intricate design, such cunning, and such masterful deceit that it threatens to shatter the very foundations of the Imperium if laid bare. Laying at the very core of the Imperium was the beating heart of secular rationalism. Yet, the Emperor's clandestine sojourns on the rusted plains of Mars spun tales so intricate they birthed an entire creed, where he stood not as a mere mortal, but a deity incarnate. And as he now sits upon the golden throne, more god than man, it forces one to probe the dark recesses of thought, what lay beneath the veneer of his proclaimed intentions. Alas, much like ancient myths lost to the sands of time, the essence of the Emperor remains ensnared in the snares of propaganda and cries of heresy. The remnants of his genuine musings are as scattered and rare as stars in the void, their veracity perpetually under scrutiny. For in the grim dark cosmos of the far future, truth often falls prey to the machinations of the Imperium and its faceless custodians. Yet, by peering intently at the echoes of his deeds, we may glean a semblance of the truth from the aftershocks they birthed. In the somber annals of the cosmos, whispered between the voids of the stars, an ancient legend unfolds. It's a saga so drenched in allegory, it's hard to discern myth from reality. The tale tells of the Emperor, humanity's undying sentinel, clashing against a cosmic entity known as the Void Dragon, this primordial force, a vestige of a godlike race that dissolved into nothingness ages before the whispering tales of the warp took form, tested the mettle of the Emperor. In a battle that defies comprehension, it's told that the Emperor didn't just defeat this eldritch abomination. He ensnared a fragment of its very essence, chaining it deep within the iron bowels of Mars, in the enigmatic catacombs of the Noctis Labyrinth. From this captured shard of malevolent consciousness, an eerie resonance spread across the crimson planet. It was a psychic undercurrent, weaving through the minds and machines, sowing the seeds of the machine cult, which would inevitably bloom into the omnipotent Mechanicum, the very hand the God Emperor required to shape his vast dominion. As the legend goes, it birthed the belief in the Omnissiah, portraying the Emperor not just as a monarch, but as the living vessel of the Machine God. Yet there lingers a perilous undertone. The whisperers in the dark corridors of the Imperium murmur of dire consequences, if this tale were ever unfurled in its entirety. The Mechanicus might denounce their undying Lord as a charlatan, and the great Imperium, that bastion of mankind's hope, might crumble into an age of shadow, sundered by an internal cataclysm that could dwarf any known war. For a new religion to blossom, 
all others must be purged. In the shadowed gasping breaths of the 41st millennium, humanity clings with fervent zeal to the worship of the God Emperor. If whispers of truths were to arise, would they be smothered as vile heresy? As the insidious tendrils of chaos trying to twist the faithful, or would some, perhaps with a glint of understanding in their eyes, perceive it as the Emperor's grand tapestry, every thread woven with care to safeguard humanity. Many amongst the ranks of the Mechanicus, whether in hushed reverence or bold defiance, do not prostrate before the God Emperor as their true Omnissiah. In the arcane depths of their forges, they hold on to ancient creeds of reason and enlightenment unfettered by religious shackles, would revelations sway such hearts, or have they long suspected? Yet a chilling question lingers in the void. Did the Emperor, in all his vast wisdom and foresight, truly grasp the abyss he would carve into the very souls of mankind? Was he aware that he would stand as the beacon, in that darkness, as the lone priest once dared to utter? Or was he a cornered, desperate entity, blessed or cursed with an all-seeing eye who took a gamble against the vastness of the cosmos and was met with cruel defeat? To be continued. Did you like the graphic novel-style unofficial lore book to these tales? Check out Patreon and become a member for full graphic novels with text as seen on screen now. Thank you.